All right, everyone. So um, we'll try to work like this, see if that um, works. Um, sorry for the, let's see, uh, sorry for all the technical problems. We'll see whether we can go all, all to school today and make it work that way. So um, I want to turn um, our attention now from uh, what we were doing to unsupervised learning, okay? So I'm gonna start talking mostly today about unsupervised. And can you all see? Yeah? Um, so there are a variety of methods that um, have been proposed and used over the years to do unsupervised uh, learning. And remember that everything that we've seen to date assumes that we have our uh, training set, which is given by um, the XIs and the YIs, right? For I1 through N, and the number of uh, simples that we have. Our XIs, oops, as always, are defined in some space, usually the real domain of p dimensions. And our yi's are either 0, 1, or maybe negative 1, 1, right? If we're doing classification, uh, this class or not this class, right? That's what we've been uh, defining. Um, or the yi's can also be defined in some other space of q dimensions, right? Um, in regression. So now the question is, um, how are we going to uh, work with either a very small number of pairs, uh, meaning a small number of yi's, but lots of xi's, or even better, right, in unsupervised. What we really want is to still do some learning when the xi's are available, but the yi's are not. So this is not given, right? And now, obviously, I have to say, this is not only the hottest topic right now in machine learning, this is the topic in machine learning, right? Because uh, right now, with the methods that we have defined throughout this course, and uh, this is coming to an end very soon, we have just this uh, short lecture plus another full lecture. Um, but um, after everything that you have learned, hopefully, during this uh, set of lectures, you can do most of what uh, people do out there. Given that you, that you have access to a well-labeled data set like this one, right? And specifically, if you, if you want to use things like deep learning, as we have seen here, why is deep learning popular? It's not that it's much better than other methods um, if you have a small number of turning samples. The great advantage of deep learning is that when that N in that label set is huge, deep networks do not saturate as fast, right? And this is a great advantage to us, so we want to take advantage of that, right? And for that, that means that you have to spend a tremendous amount of resources uh, collecting the data first, right, these XIs, but then also spend a tremendous amount of resources finding the corresponding YIs, right? And for some problems, like say uh, in computer vision, in object recognition, where you have to say whether the object in the image is a chair or a table or a car or a person, that you can hire basically anyone, right? So back a few years ago, Amazon um, had this system on their website called Amazon Mechanical Turk, uh, which allows you to ask people anywhere in the world, basically, who ha that has access to Amazon, to go there and for a small pay that you provide them for, say, every image that they label, they'll do whatever task you ask them to do, right? Label that image, label the action in a video, what have you. Um, so for problems like this, this could be time consuming, you know, lengthy, maybe even expensive, but doable, right? But for many other tasks in computer vision, tasks that you're going, going to encounter out there, 
that's just not possible, right? Um, there are two problems. Number one is you need expertise to label most data, right? So that's a huge problem. But number two, even if you don't need expertise or you can give that expertise to people, most of the data you will want to label is probably protected by some rules or, or privacy uh, uh, concerns or, or laws that apply. So it's not like you can take the medical records, for example, of people and put them in the internet so people that do have a degree, right, label them as X, Y, and Z. You just can't do that, right? Uh, and the same applies to many other things. So um, there are now companies that are starting to uh, pop up that will do the annotations for you, right? So it's a business. Right now it's become, um, there's still concerns about how are they going to solve this technicality of, um, uh, of privacy. But let's say that they figure out, right, that there is a way around that. Uh, then it's just going to be terrible expensive to do that through another a third party, right, another company to have all these uh, labeled if you want to build very large data sets. So the holy grail then obviously is um, if we can do uh, unsupervised learning. So, um, okay, that's not what I want to do. Um, oh, oh, I see, okay. So before, um, before I turn into the methods that most people use for unsupervised learning, um, let me um, give you some things that you could do to try to improve over what we already have. So one thing is called transfer learning, and I would have loved to have, say, half a lecture on this, um, but unfortunately our time is coming to an end and we don't have time. But I just want to point out that this is an area of interest um, right now. And the idea is that if I already have a labeled data set that I have used to train a system, can I then use that system on a different problem? So transfer that learning that I have done using a data set A to some other data set B, okay? And um, the question, I mean, obviously the short answer is you cannot do great, but you can do it. Um, so the way people will do this is they'll, uh, for example, in computer vision, that's um, the area where, where uh, this is most popular right now, you will train the system to recognize objects, say with this huge data set that I already mentioned called ImageNet, right? So you train the system to recognize objects, uh, you train a huge network, like a ResNet or an Inception, and once you have this, then you want to use that network to do, say, image segmentation, right? Image segmentation means that you are delineating um, the objects in an image, right? Or pointing each pixel, uh, uh, course, uh, to, to which object each pixel corresponds to, right? Things of that nature. Um, then what you do is, well, I can label a little data, right? I can do some of this minor labeling with a small n for segmentation, but it just cannot. Uh, spend a lot of time and money and resources to annotate millions of images for image segmentation. So can I use that pre-trained network on image classification and then just tune it a little, right, on very tiny small data set uh, for image segmentation and see how well it works, right? And it turns out that it, it works sort of okay. Um, so this is uh, from a paper that was just posted a few weeks ago on archive, so this is not even published. <laughs> but these are the latest results that are out there as of today. Um, this is for different networks that are indicated here. This is um, the top one accuracy on ImageNet uh, for classification. Uh, so going from, as you see, 72 to about 80% accuracy. And how well these algorithms transfer to other problems, okay? And as you can see, given by this factor of transferability, if you will, which is given by this equation down here, um, then the better the algorithm does in general, the better it transfers to other problems. So um, 
For example, something like an Inception version 4 that I mentioned in our last lecture will transfer the best right, of all these uh, classes and is one of the networks that gives you the, uh, the best or top classification in ImageNet. So this is one thing that uh, you can do. Um, the other thing that people um, try to do to see how I can improve on the classification accuracy, the algorithms I would for right defined, or design algorithms that either require less training data or can transfer better, is to try to understand what these networks do, right? And one way to, because remember, we have no idea what any nonlinear system does, right? We can, uh, we can know what, uh, say, an LDA, linear discriminant analysis algorithm does, or what a, um, a, a classified linear classifier does, because they are linear. And when I have a function, f, right, f of x equals y, when that f is a linear mapping function, I can, once I have learned f, I can invert f, f inverse, right? And that will tell me how do I go from y to x, right? So meaning, um, if I go here, meaning that if I have x is my input again, say p dimensions, right? y my output of q dimensions. So if I have f of x equals y, I can also do f inverse of y equals x, right? So for a given, say, class or for a given output of a regressor, I can try to figure out um, what the input is, right? And you did that already, uh, you may remember, when you uh, inverted the idea of eigenfaces, right? Or eigenobjects, we actually did for many objects, right? So you were looking for the inverse function. And what did that tell you? That, tell, that told you which pixels in the image were more significant for different objects, right? So when you were doing PCA for, uh, to recognize apples uh, or cows or faces, the pixels that were more cor most correlated among themselves, right, for these different categories were different, right? And I said, that's a beauty of PCA that it actually tells you which correlations you find and that's how you can do classification with PCA, right? Um, we could do that because it's a linear function, but here in deep networks, right, we, or any other nonlinear classifier regressor, we're using nonlinear mapping functions. So if f is nonlinear, uh, f inverse is not solvable, right? I mean, it is solvable. There is an infinite number of solutions, right? There are an infinite number of f's that are f inverse that will map you back to the original space given the mapping, right? That's a problem. That's what a nonlinear function does. That's called the pre-image problem, right? And statistics and uh, functional analysis. So how are you going to solve this in deep networks? So one option in deep networks is you start with the network, right, that we had. So we're going to start with our network. Say that we had something like this, right? This is our network that goes in this direction, feed forward. And I have x as my input, y as my output, and my matrix w of my weights, right? And how does this usually work? The way it works is I have x, I have y, right? And I use gradient descent to change the weights during training, right? To see which weights map me, my, my map, excuse me, my input x to my desirable y, right? That's how we usually do these things. Um, but once the network has been trained, what I can do is, now it's already trained, so I can fix the weights. The weights are fixed now. I can specify the y that I want, say a chair, right? Or if it's a regressor, a, an output of that regressor function. And then use gradient descent to change x. So I start x with some random noise like this, right? I initialize randomly my input x, and then using gradient descent with a fixed w, 
I change the input instead, right, to see which one maximizes, right, the loss function at the output, right? And usually, um, remember, uh, or at least originally, uh, you were maximizing the logistic regression, right? Uh, the logistic, excuse me, the logistic sigmoidal function uh, for, uh, for classification. So by doing this, then if you repeat it, when you optimize, this is the type of input that you get for different types of classes. So um, this is a specifically, um, I don't know if it's clear here, this, if I remember correctly, and it looks like so in this slide, this is for the class banana, right? So if you are trying in ImageNet to know what is the input that is going to maximize my output banana, then this is the input. And you can see kind of a banana here, piece of a banana here and here, right? So that's a type of image that that network likes for that category. Um, and here are, so here is the banana, right? Here are for other objects, right? That you may, ants, starfish, screws, and so on, right? So you get the idea of what this does. Now, um, this became so popular, these images, people loved them uh, when this came out just a few years ago, I think like a couple years ago, um, that um, these guys that started to doing this, and they created a company uh, that does art from this, right? And they called it uh, what I had here, right? They called it this deep dream. This is, this is what they say, the network dreams. If it's uh, thinking about the banana, you will dream this, right? Um, but you can apply this in a variety of ways. And then for a specific image, you can modify the image and get weird images like this. Um, you can also take an image like this and say that you want to optimize it to this type of output, right? And then it will output something like this, right, this side. Um, and here's another example, right? Um, so they actually, if you go to deepdream.something.com or whatever it is, right, you can actually um, work with the company and, and get those uh, images, right? So you have these applications that you can use. Um, so anyways, people love these things. Um, but they're useful to us because then they tell us um, what we can do. So. Um, most importantly to us, this has a, another interesting um, fundamental importance in machine learning. The point is that this, remember, is nothing else than the image that maximizes the probability of outputting screw or whatever category you have at the output, right? So if I input that image, that's the output I'm gonna get. Um, so what you can do is you can take the information or some information of these images and add it to an image of a car, let's say, okay? But you do that in a way that this image is not even perceivable to the human eye, right? So when you look at the original image of the car and the modified image, they look exactly the same, right? but you put the image through the network and the network will say screw or banana, whatever uh, of, this, uh, of these images you have used to modify the original image of a car. You will trick the network easily. That's called an adversarial attack, okay? And this has been a huge problem and a, a point of tremendous debate in the community on how to address it, right? How to solve these problems. Because if I have a system that is susceptible to attacks that anyone that knows this basic fact can do to a network, then my network can be very dangerous. I mean, imagine a network like this running in a self-driving car, right? And I have a stop sign that I have modified, right? That I have painted in a way that has an adversarial attack and it says, I don't know, right? Something crazy. I mean, you can kill people, right? It's that, that, that serious. So um, this is very important. Uh, so 
several points. Remember um, how to do this. Um, the area, this is only obviously a, a very simplistic version of what um, it, people do these days. You can do that for every single node of the network or every single module of these modules that we have been defining, remember? You can do that for every single node or module. So you can actually know what type of image maximizes, is maximized, right? Or, max, or what type of image maximizes the activation of that specific node, right? And if you do that, for example, as I mentioned uh, in another lecture, if you do that for early layers in the network, you see in computer vision, you see things that resemble Gabor filters, right? Um, sparse representations. And if you do that for later layers, it's a very abstract things that uh, correspond more to object categories, things of that nature. So all this is uh, uh, within a new area of machine learning that's called interpretability or explainability. Okay, there are two different very related areas. And the goal is try to define algorithms that can first interpret what these networks do, because we have no idea. To us right now, they are completely black boxes, right? That's why people have to, why I have to, to teach you, okay, this is what works for deep networks, right? You build networks, uh, you build blocks like the inception, and then you put a lot of convolutions, and you have to put the layers in this way, and you have to use this batch normalization. I have to teach you this because people don't know how to build these networks, right? You just keep trying, and when something works, you publish it, and then everyone knows that that works. That's it, right? And the reason it works this way is because we're stuck. We don't really know, right? We don't really have much information on what these networks do. If we did, we could build networks in a much more um, efficient way. So um, interpretability attempts to understand, interpret what these networks do. Okay, and explainability tries to explain why uh, these networks do what they do, right? All right, so huge areas uh, of research right now. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk about this morning class in a couple of years, um, maybe less, um, at the rate that these things are moving. Um, now, beyond the problem that I have given you here called adversarial, attacks, right, the adversarial uh, images that you can generate, um, I don't want to leave you with the impression that these systems work uh, very accurately. So I said in my last lecture that um, these networks, the uh, latest networks, right, I just, ha I just showed you actually here, these results, right? So uh, inception before, uh, this NASNet large, for example, they achieve over 80% accuracy, right? About 90%. Some of them, it depends on the problem in ImageNet, but they can achieve uh, about 90% accuracy on some tasks, right? Some computer vision tasks, which is comparable to, human, to humans. Now, when I said that, I qualified this, right? I said these networks right now are as good as humans, if not better in some cases, right? Some small cases for this particular data set, right? And that qualification means a lot, right? It doesn't mean that object recognition is a solved problem. I want to clarify it. Image recognition, for example, in co computer vision is not a solved problem. Speech recognition is not a solved problem, right? I said also in class that I speak to my phone all the time, right? And yeah, about 95, 99% of the time, it gets it right. But not all the time, right? You don't have that problem. It's not like, oh, 95%, I understand perfectly. But then 5% of the time, I have no idea what the instructor is, is saying. Uh, it would be silly, right? Or, or my partner, or my mom, or my dad, right? <laughs> it makes no sense. Uh, so obviously, these problems are not completely solved, right? Now, can we do? tremendous amount, uh, uh, or can we do things that are amazing to us um, researchers because just five years ago, we weren't able to do them. Yes, that's fantastic, right? But there's a long way ahead. So I'll just give you another example of this before moving on, um, which again, this is an archive paper not been published yet, and it just was posted like, I think, 
two weeks ago, maybe uh, thereabouts, um, which uh, has tested these best networks with images that have been modified, right? So they are going to take a background image, say like this one right here, and then they're going to superimpose an object, right? And this is a 3D model of the object, so they can superimpose it in a variety of poses, right? Now, when they do it like this, the network says school bus with 1% probability, good, everything works fine. Now, when you put the bus like this, you have no problem identifying this as a school bus. Well, the network says it's a garbage truck with 99% certainty. Um, and you put it like this, it's a punching bug, you know, when you're in the gym, I guess. Uh, and when you put it like this, it's a snowplow with 92% chance, right? Uh, so obviously these networks get really confused <laughs> uh, when they see objects in a position or an orientation or a location or an environment that they're not used to, right? Uh, here are other examples. Uh, this is a scooter. Okay, no problem here, but you put it like this, and I'll say it's a parachute. I mean, explain that. I, I, just, I, don't, I just don't know. Uh, fire truck. Um, now it's a school bus here. Okay. <laughs> uh, here, this is interesting. This is a fire boat because it's upside down. Um, so, anyways, right? There is a lot of work ahead. Um, so the systems are amazing, they work really well, but with a qualifier, right, that, um, that we have to acknowledge. Uh, I've posted here a few more examples um, for you to see. Uh, for phones, um, I think it's an iPod, which is not too bad, I think. Microwave, it's a little worse. Uh, remote control, not too bad. Um, anyways, uh, this is also... Um, from an, this is from an older paper, uh, it was uh, 2016, so about a couple years ago, where um, they showed that if you take from images, you take windows, right, the small patches of that um, image, and then you send it through the network, the network also is unable to do classification of these things. But you and I have no problem, right? If we're given this image, you have no problem knowing what's going on, right? If you're given this, you can tell me what this is, or if I give you this, or even this, right? You can tell me exactly what that is, uh, and this. <laughs> but these networks don't, right? They have problems with this type of uh, low resolution crops. Um, all right, any questions? That's fine. So how can we improve on this? Um, well, we're going to try to use um, unsupervised learning. And we're going to be working primarily with a variety of techniques. So let me um, maybe um, talk about different types of unsupervised learning that that I just want to briefly mention. So, so if I if I have unsupervised learning methods, I'm gonna briefly mention uh, non-probabilistic models. Okay, um, these are um, very. Uh, very standard, uh, very famous methods that have been used over the years. Um, one of them that we have already seen is k-means um, that you may remember, right? The probabilistic extension of that was mixture of models, right? So k-means um, can, um, can be used, as I mentioned uh, back then when we talk about k-means, to do some unsupervised learning with clustering. But you can also um, use autoencoders. And I've briefly mentioned them. I'm going to talk more about them today. And sparse coding. Now, sparse coding is an area that I discuss in tremendous detail in computer vision because it has been applied in computer vision extensively. 
So if you're going to take my computer vision class next year, then you'll learn a lot about this. I'm just going to very briefly talk about them. But the idea is to find the sparse representations. Remember, sparse meaning that most of your uh, parameters values are zero, right? And just a few of them are non-zero representative of the data. And um, so we'll talk briefly about this. Then obviously the alternative is to use, to use probabilistic models. And then remember that in probabilistic models, we've already talked about this a lot. We usually call this generative. Remember? Models. And we call them generative because once you have learned the underlying distribution of your data, of your class or whatever you're representing, then you can use that model, that, pro that density, to draw additional samples that you have never observed before, right? Correct? So that's a, um, a, a common way to, to, to call them uh, or to, uh, to name them generative models. All right, so in generative models, there are um, what you could call uh, tractable models or also you can call them uh, fully observed or observable models. Um, and some of them that um, you will see out there, uh, for, for example, belief nets, which I will not talk about, uh, pixel uh, convolutional neural networks or RNNs, uh, that were popular for a while. Um, I'll briefly mention these things. Um, and then you have, let's see, what else? You have the so-called, I guess, non-tractable models. Um, these are um, more famous. Um, uh, for example, the most famous of them all, it would be Boltzmann machines. Um, but you also have a variety of other methods like uh, variational autoencoders. Um, also, helmets, maybe. Machines. Um, I'll talk briefly today about Boltzmann very briefly. And then um, the third one is um, what I would call the implicit density estimation. So implicit density estimation. And these we will cover in our last lecture. Um, and this include um, things like moment machine nets, um, which is a uh, method we will not talk about, but primarily we will talk um, in our last lecture about a method that would fit into this that has become the prominent area of research right now and of interest, which are called GANs or Generative Adversarial Networks. Super exciting, as you'll see. Super exciting. All right. OK, so first, uh, let me briefly talk about sparse coding. Now, remember, um, I'm going to talk about this one right here for non-probabilistic models, OK? Now, in a sparse coding, or sparse coding in general, 
means nothing else than my input xi can be represented as a linear combination, right, say from 1 through m, of a certain number of bases um, phi j, right, with the corresponding weights a i j. And what is most interesting here is that, remember, xi is given by a space of p dimensions, that m can be larger than p. In fact, m could even be much larger than p, right? So you may actually be uh, overrepresenting uh, the data, right, the information that you have. And that has an inspiration in neuroscience again. Um, these methods became really popular in computational neuroscience for a while because it is interesting that when we collect data in the back of the retina, right, we use about 105, 110 million sensors. That's the cones and rods that read the information from the light source that reaches our retina, okay? But then that information in the retina itself is reduced to just about 10 million uh, ganglion cells that send axons back to the back of the brain. Okay? And the reason this happens is because these axons, right, which are nothing else than cables, okay, that lift the retina, the back of your eye, right? So remember, um, the eye looks something like this. I'm going to do a sagittal view as always, um, and I'm going to do a very terrible drawing of an eye because it's hard enough to do it on the board, but here in this piece of paper, it's impossible. So if this is the lens, right, that you have in your eye, and I'm just cutting it laterally like this, sagittally, um, so the light comes in this way, and you have all the sensors here, right, and your retina, and then all this information has to leave somehow the eye, and there's this blind spot that you may know from image processing when we talked about this, there's this blind spot that uh, doesn't see, right? So you actually have in each eye a blind spot that doesn't see the world, it's just filled in by the brain as if we had sensors in there, but we don't, and I showed you how to, to test us uh, in image processing. But at any rate, um, the larger the number of uh, ganglion cells that send information to the back of the brain, the bigger that spot would be, right? Because the cables take space. Um, so the brain has decided that I'm going to reduce from more than 100 million to just 10 million, right? That's a huge reduction. But then as soon as you reach the back of the brain, there's an explosion in representation, right? That gets multiplied by, by a, a degree, right? An order of magnitude. So, um, so why? What's it going on? So one of the ideas was sparsity, right? That you're actually uh, overrepresenting with a set phi j, right? J1 through m that is larger than what you need. But that this set is very sparse. And when you learn this system um, with the equations, I'm, the next equation I'm going to give you, uh, you get something that resembles, anyone wants, wants to guess? If I'm using images of, of course. Gabor filters, right? It comes back over and over and over again, right? And if you uh, use electrodes, as I already mentioned, right, um, to measure the activation of these cells in, say, the macaque, the monkey, um, uh, and you reconstruct the response of these cells, they look like Gabor's, right? Everything ends up being a Gabor filter at the end of the day. Um, so uh, how do you train this? Well, you need to use a, a loss function or a, an optimization function, right? And what you're going to do, you're going to try to minimize, and you want to minimize both the weights and your uh, flies that you're representing. So you're going to create a loss, um, the square loss, for example, which does, it sums over all your samples, right? And then over all your uh, bases, phi j's, so that this equation holds, right? And this is the square loss, this is the true norm and the square loss, right? And note 
that this loss function here is usually called, in computer vision is very common, it's usually called the reconstruction error. Okay, and why is it called the reconstruction error? Because what it measures is how well can I reconstruct X given that set of basis uh, images, right? That's simple. Uh, now, if you just do that, you're not going to get sparsity as you want, right? So you need to constrain this. How are we going to constrain it? Anyone? You're going to regularize it. Very good, right? So you're going to add lambda times a regularizer. And typically, what you're going to do, you're going to add or you're going to impose that the norm of this coefficients is small. And here you're going to use, typically people use norm 1, right? Because remember, we've gone over, we went over this. Norm 1 imposes sparsity. You could use a quasi-norm, right, between 0 and 1. Or you could use, some people use what they call the zero norm. Now I say zero norm because a zero norm is not a norm. <laughs> it's not even a quasi-norm, right? The zero norm, what it means is if you were to follow, right, from norm one to all the quasi-norms to zero, then at the zero, all you're doing is counting the number of elements in your vector that are non-zero, right? If I want to minimize the number of elements that are non-zero, then obviously the minimum is they're all zero. So this imposes extreme sparsity, right? Uh, people also use the infinite norm and other norms, uh, excuse me, not the, the nuclear norm, which is another uh, variation that people have defined. But um, uh, it's just up to you, you know, the, uh, one of these norms, the zero norm, the one norm, uh, the nuclear norm, but uh, basically this will impose sparsity in your representation. So this uh, works pretty well uh, for some problems. And then the way you are going to apply this, say, to uh, classification in computer vision is you're going to learn this, and then now these five J's are going to be your features of your feature space. Right? And after this, you have your feature space, you're going to use any classifier or regressor that we have defined in class. Right? Train. Okay. <clears throat> now the the other one that I have mentioned, and let me go back here. Now um, I'm done with non-probabilistic models. That was quick, right? <laughs> so I'm moving forward to pro I'm moving uh, to probabilistic uh, methods. Or actually, um, all right. Let me do this because I'm gonna need that. Um, Hmm. Um, all right, uh, hold on, let me see. All right, uh, let me do autoencoders because I'm going to need this here, the autoencoders. So let me talk very briefly about autoencoders. So um, we have seen this already, right? You start with some data, right? This is my data, say X, right? And then you send this through a encoder, And that basically gives you a representation, right? In some latent space, right? Some latent representation. And then you use a decoder here to get a reconstruction of the input x. So maybe I'll call this x hat, right? And then basically you want x hat to be as close to your original x as you can, right? That's the idea of an autoencoder. So we have seen an we saw several autoencoders uh, early in the course. PCA, autoencoder, right? You know how to encode and how to decode. ICA, FA, and so on, right? All those are autoencoders, but you can represent them also as uh, deep neural networks, right? And the function, if you want to implement the neural network, the loss function that you're going to use, 
again, is going to, um, let's see, if I call this um, my, uh, what am I going to do here? Um, so I'm going to do, I'm going to take, say, my uh, DZ, right? So I'm taking this latent space representation here. I'm decoding it with some matrix. And that I'm going to compare it with my input that I have, right? This is my classical two norm, the reconstruction norm that I want to have. And now I'm going to add a regularizer on Z. Most likely, I want this to be sparse, my latent space. I want it to be sparse. So I'm going to add a one norm. And that you can consider as this part right here of the network, right? So this is the decoder. Oops. Right? And now I need to add one more thing to that loss function, which is the encoder. So this encoder is going to be some function, say a logistic sigmoidal, for example, or whatever other function that you're using, uh, the weights of that part of the network, and Z, right? So now this is going to be uh, this um, W transpose X minus, now I'm missing something here, right? And the reconstruction, okay? And what am I, what am I doing? Oops, not transpose, excuse me, because I'm using actually X now, right? So what am I trying to construct here? I'm trying to go from X, right, to Z, right? So I have to compare this with Z, the latent space, correct? All right. So that's it. Um, that's, that's how you would do it. And, and now, how can you build a completely unsupervised method with this? So here's what you can do. You can take your input data and use this, this loss function to train a network, right? With, say, one layer, a latent space representation, and another layer, right? An encoder and decoder. This could be multiple layers, or it could be just one layer, right? Um, all right, so you train this, and you learn to reconstruct, right? Uh, now, once you have this, what you do is you see the decoder and the reconstruct, you get rid of this part, right? You just stay here. You keep the encoder, right, and the corresponding output. And now what you do, you take this corresponding output, and you use it as data, and you train another encoder decoder, right, or another autoencoder. And you keep repeating this. And at the end, you just get rid of all the decoders, and you stack all the encoders, right? And what you get at the end? Well, at the end, you get nothing else than here's my input say X, right? And now I have the first encoder that I derive, and then I have my second, so let me call it maybe one, and then I have my encoder two, and so on, right? Up to my encoder number, whatever I have, and then here at the end, I have my output, right? You see how this works? So here's a, uh, the basic idea, right? Uh, you have here in the slides. So you can build this space, impose a sparsity in your features, obviously, in your uh, latent space representation. Then you get rid of the uh, decoders, and you end up with an output, right? And now, once you end up with this code, then you can reconstruct the, the code if you want, right? The, uh, the final latent space that you're that you're given, and you can decode the image. And because you have added nonlinearities here, uh, people claim that this is a nonlinear extension of PCA, right? That you could consider this as a nonlinear extension of PCA. So, for example, for these faces here, this is the original input, right? The original images. This is a reconstructed PCA, and this is, oh, actually, it's the opposite. <laughs> This is incorrect. Right, this is reconstructed from the autoencoder uh, here, and this is the PCA, right? 
And you see that obviously depends on the resolution and the number of PCs that you use, but in that case, this does significantly better because of these nonlinearities, right? Okay. Um, there's also one more that I'm not going to talk about. Um, There's called semantic hashing, and this is a particular of particular interest if you are going to if you're going to use binary features, okay, or binary coding. So if you want to use binary features, as I've said many times. Um, uh, or binary coding for your objects or your entries, right? Um, the algorithms that you end up with, right, are very simple, some of them. You can make them run really quick. Even, even the nearest neighbor that we saw in binary coding runs super fast, right, in polynomial time. Um, the problem in in that case is not how to use the algorithms that we have defined or how to redefine these algorithms, but rather how to go from non-binary coding to binary coding. That's a real problem. <laughs> and that's a really hard problem that is unsolved. Okay? But if you could solve this, then um, you could use these methods in uh, semantic hashing to, to solve for. All right, so let me go to tractable um, very briefly also. And in tractable, basically what um, you're going to say is that I'm going to try to model my probability. So I have, say, my probability PMM, the model of my data X, right? And this is going to be given by, say, one way to model this is the probability of my model for my first input, x1, multiply by the product of the probabilities of my model for xi. Now i is going to go from 2, because I already have 1 right here, from 2 to n, given x, uh, where is it, uh, i minus, um, excuse me, yeah, i minus 1 through 1, right? given the previous ones. And remember that we talked about this when we discuss um, uh, Markov models and when we discuss graphical models, right? Talk about this formulation, remember? And this formulation um, is useful, sometimes actually called mixture of experts because each of these probabilities here on the right-hand side uh, are called experts, right? They're models uh, that are expert on a specific data input, um, and you have a mixture of them. And the thing is that you can model, you can represent each of these uh, probabilities uh, as a deep neural network. The neural network, remember, is nothing else than estimating uh, the underlying distribution of the data, right? That f of x. So you could use that to represent, um, to, to learn to represent that image. Now, um, if you're interested in reading more about this, uh, you can um, read about pixel CNNs. And this is pixel convolutional neural networks and also pixel RNNs um, that we have talked about. And these models were um, they're still sort of popular. They were defined in, about, I think, 2016, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they were pretty well. Uh, but then GANs came along and then just took the, the, the whole uh, area by a storm. Okay? So I'll talk more about GANs because that's uh, what people believe it's um, the desirable solution now. All right, and so this would be here in the tractable models. Another uh, method is called belief nets. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about this, but uh, so that you know that there's this other one. And then in non-tractable, um, I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, Boltzmann machines now. Um, so in Boltzmann, Uh, 
Impulsement machines, um, what we're going to do, we're going to try to represent our probability, theta, the parameters as always, of vh. I'm going to represent this in some um, latent space of my parameters. And I'm going to use an exponential function to model this probability. That's what Boltzmann machines do. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take my matrix of weights. So I'm going to take the ith jth weight multiplied by vi and hj plus the sum of my uh, vi um, h, um, that should be b rather, uh, plus or bi plus the sum of my j's, xj, aj. Okay, and here my parameters, theta, are my matrix of unknowns, uh, or weights rather, and w, a, and b, which are these two that I have given here. Come. This, um, uh, to train this, uh, what you're going to do is um, to train the, uh, these models, you're going to use the trick or the approach rather that we use so many times in classification, which is we're going to compute the maximum likelihood, right? So solve for maximum likelihood. And this is the likelihood of the parameters is given by one over n, the sum um, of all n of the log of the probability that I have to find here, right? Of um, v n. Uh, and if you want to do that, remember for maximum likelihood, we're going to take the partial derivative of this, right? So I'm going to take the partial derivative with respect to the parameters, which is nothing else than 1 over n, the sum of the, su the uh, partial derivative for each of the parameters times the log of the sum over all h of the exponential function of um, my Vn transpose times W times H plus A transpose H plus B transpose Vn minus now the um, log of my latent space of the uh, parameters, okay? Now, if you use this method, you're going to end up with somewhat um, a sparse representations. And I say somewhat because the representation is not totally sparse in the sense that you have zeros mostly everywhere, non-zeros in some other point. But you're going to have high values in a few number of points and very low values everywhere else. Right? So if you threshold these small numbers out, then you can get sparse representations as well, right? Um, so anyways, just to give you an idea. Now, I could have 10 lectures on Boltzmann machines. They can get really complicated, right? But they were very powerful methods for a while. Uh, people still use them, they're very powerful. But then um, uh, gener other gener uh, generative methods in general came along, right? So let me give you a very brief introduction to implicit density estimation, and then um, we'll do gener um, GANs in our next and final lecture. So for generative methods in general, We could use a variety of methods that we have already defined. So obviously, I could use mixture models, correct? We spent quite a bit of time defining those. 
Remember here, the probability of x given my parameters is given by the sum, right, of my um, pj's. Um, let's say, actually, why don't I say the, the, if I do a mixture of normal models, the prior probability, pj, times the normal model of my xi given my um, mu j and sigma j, right? That's what we defined, right? And I'll sum over i and j here. Right? So that is an obvious way to define generative models, right? And that, I explain it in detail in its time. And this is a great way to do it, right? OK? So I encourage you to test this. And we're going to have this uh, final um, optional project that you can get for some extra credit. And um, you can compare the results of mixture models with GANs, right? That we'll introduce in our next lecture. But you could do that, right? And then in your feature space, what's going to happen is that if you have your feature space here, right, you're going to learn your underlying distribution using, say, a mixture of Gaussians like this, right? And now, once you have this mixture of Gaussians, you can draw samples, right, from your distribution and generate new samples that you have never seen, right? So if I train uh, the system to represent, to model images of cars, right, or people saying hello, right, then once I know the underlying distribution of hello, I can get new people that I've never met saying hello, right? <laughs> uh, or I can get images of cars that I've never seen, right? Uh, and that works not so well, but it depends how, how much string data you have. It depends the number of models that you use. Remember, in mixture models, you have to define the number of models, right? It depends how well the EM algorithm works in your particular problem and the uh, specific training data that you give it. And the EM algorithm is not great, right? Great in the sand is not fantastic. It's still better than the EM for these type of problems. Uh, making the EM algorithm work for a problem that doesn't have an obvious initialization other than the k-means, it's not very good. So it's not ideal. So it doesn't work terribly bad. It sort of works, but not perfect. The other um, way that you could do that is with manifold learning, right? So here, remember, in your feature space, what you're trying to find is to define, rather, is define the manifold, right, that defines all your samples. So if you have a number of samples here and you define the manifold that describes these samples, now I can draw new samples, say images of faces, right, from this manifold and obtain new faces. And that works actually probably a little better than mixture models, at least for this type of generating images, OK? Not much better than mixture models. It depends how well you know how to optimize Gaussian mixture models. If you are really good at Gauss Gaussian mixture models, they do really well, right? But uh, manifold learning is easier to use um, with, uh, for example, Laplacian uh, manifolds that I introduced, right? Um, so that, those two methods uh, work really well. The other um, method that you can use to do that, that we just saw, is to use autoencoders, right? Um, so here, basically, remember, what we're trying to do is minimize the reconstruction error. So I, I have something like, I can call this the, um, the decoder, the encoder, and xi. maybe plus a regularizer, right? So basically, the idea here is that I encode my information, then I decode my information, and I want to reconstruct as accurately as possible. Obviously, you cannot design the encoder and the decoder in a way 
that they give you the identity matrix mapping function, because then, well, duh, right? <laughs> if my latent space is the same as my input space, then I can reconstruct perfectly. Right? So it has to be something uh, different, uh, ideally nonlinear, um, and ideally the latent space, it's uh, really tiny, right? So that you can compact things uh, a lot. Remember from back from all the way back to PCA, that that was the idea, right? of PCA and manifold learning as well, that there's a manifold of much lower dimensionality than your input feature space that can represent all the variations uh, of your data. So um, that's uh, obviously another option for you to use. And there is a variation of that. It's called variational autoencoders. Which um, what they what they do they just try to um, to to add a probabilistic model to autoencoders, right? So they they try to uh, move more toward a mixture of Gaussians, right? So they will model this uh, encoding and decoding with normal mixture models or just normal models, right? Um, and they were relatively well, right? And so these are methods that are out there and that you should be familiar with, that at least that they, you should know that they exist. Um, and then um, what we're going to do uh, in our last lecture is to work on a new set, right, of methods which are called generative adversarial networks. Okay, and um, in, in this framework, and obviously I'll talk in detail about this in, in our last lecture, in this framework, the way this works is that instead of having a an encoder and a decoder, you have what's called a generator. This is a network. It's usually modeled as a deep neural network, right? This is a network that generates new samples, new input samples, right? Like a mixture model would do when you draw samples from that mixture, right? Okay, so you just have a network that generates samples, generates access. And then you have another network that you call the discriminator. And the discriminator's task is to determine whether a sample that you give it to it corresponds to a true sample that you had at the beginning, right? Or a sample generated by the generator, a fake sample. Right? Now, how to make this work is really tricky. That's why I'm gonna take a whole lecture and ideally I should take two or three, but we'll try to do at least the basics in our last lecture. But if you can make this work, the results are stunning, absolutely stunning. Um, so, um, just to, I don't want to give away too much, um, and we'll solve the minimax problem, uh, we'll talk about all this, um, and it's the course, but, uh, these are things that you can do, um, with, uh, GANs, oops, okay, so, uh, for example, you see all the images in the first row here, right? These are real images, okay, of someone. But all these other images right here, they're all faked, they're all generated by this generator network, right? This, and the reason they are so good, they look real, right? I mean, they look real to me, believe me. Uh, this is a real image, all these are fake images, right? They're all generated by the generator. And the reason the generator gets so good at generating images is because the discriminator keeps telling it that, yeah, I can tell this is fake, right? So the generator keeps getting better and better and better. But the better it gets, the discriminator gets better at discriminating too. So <laughs> it's a battle, right? And in general, we'll show that the, the discriminator always wins, right? The generator has no chance. But 
by even though it always loses, it ends up generating some amazing images that look absolutely stunning. All right. Okay. So we'll talk about this in our last lecture. Sorry about the uh, technical problems that we had today. Uh, hopefully that uh, thing, that old technology thing, actually worked.